take a look. Okay. All right, we're trying to figure out where everyone is supposed to meet because I think there was a confusion of a meeting spot. And you have to excuse me, I have the start of a head cold, so I sound very nasally. So I'm not going to try talking a whole lot, but we will have Mike. Uh, oh, open. I just thought you were from the Northeast. I, <laughs> I, I am. Teasing you. <laughs> okay, I'm finding, I'm seeing Beth, Serena, and Stephen here in, okay, here, here. S Serena, can you hear? Hi, I'm uh, I'm in I'm simul present with Nova in Open Sim right now, so she was just finding out where are people gathering, and I'm gathering in both places. And Stephen is being a referee, I think, in three different places, trying to get everyone together. Okay. Well, then I'll. Okay, are you going to be simul present? Who are you talking to? Okay. Well, I'm just saying I can leave my avatar here and I'll go off mic because I'm probably confusing Nova right now. She's trying to get s spiff in voice. So I'm going off mic. I'm trying to get spiff to get his avatar going because I'm seeing a very white avatar. Yeah. Your, your voice is great, Spiff. <laughs> Here, here's Serena. All right. Hold on one second. This is one. One of the avatars here in Open Sim, Steven, because I'm, or is this an NPC I'm bumping into? Oh, I'm scared of NPCs. Thank you, Serena. So, are you hearing too, Serena? Can you speak here also? I'm just. Can yeah, speak? there you go. Yeah. I'm, and then you might want to mute your second life or whatever. All right, I am back. Hi, Nova. Hey, how you doing? Good. So right now, um, the only person here at the Virtual World Second Life building is Beth. And she is comfortable that she can get there. So that's good. <laughs> Um, she actually went last week by mistake. Oh my. Oh my. Well, I have Stephen doing interference and someone else is on two other grids. Well, there's so Steven. we're all trying to figure out where everyone is. Eventually, everyone should be here. Spiff is here. Steve right. is here. Right. That's what I, th I thought the direction said that we were going to meet here. Right. I'm just in Second Life to see if people need help. Jackson is on Kitely, but I think he'll be here. And, and Beth is on her way, and Thunder is on her way. Oh, great. Good, good, good. I think we'll be all set. I miss Santa. Beth. I have, I've talked to her briefly. Yeah. on on Facebook, but I, I do miss Beth. Very cool. Hi, Spiff. You sound good. I have, for some reason, no legs. But <laughs> I, I can't make it. I can't make it work. 
Um, so I know that Thunder was on the way. Okay. Do a copy and paste of that. See if we see Thunder anywhere. Thunder and Bats are both on their way. You know, I already figured this out. I just put the two worlds side by side on my screen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn our voice here and talk to uh, Thunder in Discord. Okay, hold on. Oh, that's you. Yeah, that's me. Hold on. All right, my apologies. I'm back. Hello? Yeah, we hear you. Welcome back. Okay, great. Okay. It's like the new nightmare of the metaverse. You give an entire 20 minute talk and then you realize you left your mic off or something. <laughs> yes. And the last live stream that was done, I noticed my settings were on midnight and I'm going, oh my God, it's terrible. How could I do that? Yeah. So it's a learning experience. What can I say? So, um, what grid is this on? I got, it's not Kitely. It's but is it a commercial grid? Is it a private grid? This is a private grid. This is the sign circle grid. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. But um, let me try to ask it in a more intelligent manner. Is it running on somebody's dedicated home server, or is it being run on a commercial service with? private ownership, you know, through Science Circle? That I do not know. Stephen would be better to answer that question. Okay. It probably has nothing to do with your content tonight, but <laughs> I'm, because of my own work, I'm interested. Here's Jackson. Jackson is here. S Stephen is the man to talk to for all the techno questions. Stephen says, Nova, we're going to move over here. And I go, okay. And I just follow wherever he tells me to go. Okay. Beth has to relog. Okay. Uh, here's Thunder, Serena. Thunder's showing up. There you go. Hi, Thunder. Well, I we need to friend. I have to friend everybody on there. Yes. Because if I friend them on a different grid, it doesn't, does it count? No. No. For some reason, you have to friend everyone here. Okay. Hi, Beth. I can't see you yet, but hello. Okay, there's Thunder. Wow, this is exciting. <laughs> okay, my voice is back here. I was Great. In Discord with Thunder. Back her here. Jackson right. made it and Beth made it. Yep. Beth is and rizzing. Beth is coming back. Thunder, can you hear voice?
Thunder and Stephen are still orange. Oh, I will be Yeah. Big. At least they have legs. <laughs> so jealous. People that have legs. Yeah, Serena, you are legless. I know. What's with that? <laughs> I'll make the obligatory joke that Stephen is going to be speaking. I is going easy. to watch the live stream over. <laughs> so, um, I'm also going and to. And Spiff is starting voice recording. Okay. And loving it. <laughs> Oh, this is going to be another comedy of errors. I could, I could just feel it, but it's, we're going to have you know, fun. Hey, I'm simul present with, uh, with. Uh, whoops! I got to turn my mic off. For many of us, getting here is half the battle. So this is a That's good thing. Right. Yeah. 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 And I'm always so pleased when the place doesn't crash. Yeah. So I think um, Nova. I think you could start. Okay, great. Let's let's just check with Steven. Steven, okay to start? Yeah, I'm all good and all ready to start. And wasn't actually 
Let me do one, say one thing real quick first is that we can use the teleporter, but I'm also going to drop into local chat, like the equivalent of a slurl that will also take you to our first location, but don't go there yet. Okay. Thanks, Stephen, for all your help organizing this. And Nova, thank you so much for having us. Spiff is recording, so everything you say and do will be recorded. Okay, great. Hopefully, uh, everything that's on the screen is also getting recorded. Am I correct in saying that? Yes, I think Spiff will change his camera angle and look at the screen. Okay, great. I'm going to hide I... behind Jackson and hide my hideous avatar. <laughs> As I explained, I have to start up a head cold, so I sound very nasally. So I'm going to try putting things off on the screen in local chat rather than to do a lot of talking. But I will answer all questions, and uh, let's get on with the tour. First, I want to do an introduction of myself. And I am going to put out my bio. All right, hopefully people can see that it's being placed in local chat. Okay. All right. Now, if, if you we look at the uh, the map, we're going to the aspiring archaeologist area, and there is a two second delay, so don't panic. Oh, and it's not letting me teleport. Well, this is interesting. Okay. Well, <laughs> I will go over there and start teleporting people over. But the, this is the area we're going to be at. So, Stephen, could you put that swirl out again, please, into local? There you go. Yeah, I, I'm not sure why it's not teleporting, but this is where we're supposed to go. Jackson. Oh, there he is. Yeah. Okay, no, but we're all here. Right. Okay. Here we go in local again. I was told I can't talk and walk, so. <laughs> That's true for me in real life. Here's the reading.
observations that he did. The site is placed over reconstructed units that are on top of a CAD map that I drew to show where everyone was located, where the units were located. And I positioned photos of uh, where the students were, were digging at each unit. In the back, you're going to see three uh, photo PowerPoint slides from, I think, 2006 to 2010. And if we walk in the back, Through various years. Again, the uh, Dragoosh photo is in black and white. We came across some of the excavations. I believe in 2009, we came across uh, some of his site. So I showed the contrast between the uh, the then present day site to the Dragoo site. But the place is absolutely amazing. And in my field school, let's see, I am way off in the corner. <laughs> so do we have any questions about this area? I don't know if I want well, to you, you probably it was probably <clears throat> buried in the text wall, but could you what what's your key thing you're looking for to learn? And what have you found along those lines? In this area, we were trying to establish where the uh where the the wall would have been, but then we discovered that at the time the Monagahalans were continuously coming back to the same area. Uh, so it was hard to establish where the walls were. But we want to see how how large it was uh, because the, there was the, the theory that they only had very small encampments. But with each field school, we were finding it uh, to be more expanded than it was before. So uh, I think that's what we were trying to establish, exactly how big of a complex it was. Where did it start? Where did it end? How long of a time period did they actually use it for? How many years did they continuously go back and forth? And what, was the, uh, what were the changes in between? Were they codependent on, on deer? Were they codependent on fish? Um, there's, there's so much to learn at this site. It, it was fascinating. No, but I'm sorry to say, I don't know who they that you refer to are. Oh, the Monagahela. I'm sorry. The Monagahela culture is what we were studying at this site. And where is that? Where, where does this all? This site is in Blairsville, PA. Pennsylvania. Yes. Very cool. Thank you. True, true story. I grew up in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh, and we had to learn how to spell the Ohio. Easy. Allegheny. 
not too bad. And then, Manongahila. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I, I do have one other question, Nova, and that is um, I used to spend summers in, in Alabama and we would visit a friend of my mother's academic friend in Tuscaloosa and look at, I think they were called the Mound Indian Culture. I don't know the actual name. Did yes. Was there any con connection between these two cultures? <clears throat> There was a connection. Uh, the Lake Woodland spans a large area in the United States. And when we go over to the other exhibit, I'd be able to show you a better example of what I'm trying to say. But yes, it, it was part of the Lake Woodland culture. All right, if we have no other questions, we're going to go next door to the prehistoric overview building. So I'm going to stop talking and walk. Okay, this is the prehistoric overview, uh, and as, as the sign says above, a brief summary of the Native American cultural periods, distinctive traits, and points. I wanted to give this tour in November only because it was Native American month, but December is close enough to November, so we'll just pretend it's November. We're going to walk through the uh, the transparent panel, and you're going to see my museum style exhibits. The first stop is the Paleo Indian stage. Okay, so I think I was kind of quick showing the first one. But this is the Paleo-Indian stage. And the panels explain when we believe it started and how, how it went through the years when it ended. And it's broken down into three subdivisions. The points that we found are very distinctive, and there's a chart in the back showing the type of points that were associated with this period. As I learned with the back, the, the former tour that I gave yesterday, I'm going to have to be changing these information panels because a lot of information has changed since I first put these panels up. But for now, this is uh, this is what I have. You can click on 
both maps and they will give you a note note card with more information. I have another question, Nova. <clears throat> uh huh. Uh, all right, so you've got this gorgeous detailed sim and displays, and I guess I, do you are you having people come here to visit and learn? Are you making, let's say, educational videos and putting them on YouTube like Spiff is doing right now? How are you kind of blending this uh, environment into your communication teaching plan? Okay. I guess that's that's my meta question. All right. Um, the whole basis of making this region, these regions, are for educational purposes. Uh, if teachers want to come here with their classes, they are more than welcome to. Uh, that's what our goal is. So, yes, they can be used for educational purposes. And I have sections for K through 12 as well as undergrad uh, and some I have some uh, teacher plans as well in the other area I'm I'm kind of asking because I, I don't know if you my background right now is online presence and I just spent some time you know you may know gentle heron she puts on an yes. annual disability rights conference so she set up a whole new exhibit on ableism, and I, I looked at it, and being the blunt person I am, I said, gee, I would like to make a two-minute animated multimedia animation of it with music. Mm -hmm. and, and then, I, you know, could I get copies of the slides and things? Because I was trying to avoid running around taking snapshots like Steven is suggesting. And then she consulted with her folks, and they were puzzled. They were saying they couldn't imagine what it would look like, and, well, she's a research Educator, I know, I know. Anyway, <laughs> I, I went ahead and took my own pictures and did it and um, wrote it around, and people started saying, what's the landmark? What's the So part of what I've been observing in the last few years, and I have 15 years in Second Life, so I appreciate the, the work that went into what you guys have put here. I'm, I'm finding I have to go hybrid tech and combine communication channels, and if you've got a gorgeous thing like this, I'm, what, I'm looking at a mastodon rotating in place right now. That's a hairy mammoth, I guess. And I could just see putting together, you know, a one or two minute multimedia animation with it. That would to to be get people to wonderful. come here and, and look at all the stuff like that. Yes, Boom. yes, yes. Stephen and I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, if you have... Educators in mind also bring them over. We do everything that we can to accommodate the educators. Yeah, let me comment a little bit on that too. Um, uh, I talked with Kaylee in Second Life, who has found that she gets a lot more success out of virtual worlds when she now that she uses Zoom to make sure people are oriented. She knows what people's screens look like, and that's a great way to really make sure people are using it and everybody has a smooth experience. Uh, but in this last year, the Vibe Grids basically migrated from being offline due to a enhanced security protocol at our old hosting university to now being on the Science Circle Grid. And we really appreciate the Science Circle hosting these islands now and all the work and keeping on top of them and the t troubleshooting and tech support. Um, so that was kind of our focus for this year. And I think what we really want to do now that everything's established is to really make sure that we have these uh, educator collaborations. Uh, Nova is not an educator. I also am no longer an educator. So we really hope that um, where people see that this is something that they can do within their coursework, that they you know reach out to us and to Nova and try and collaborate where we can. But I really appreciate your suggestion. I think that's really good. Nova, I hope you're listening. That um, yes. you know, if you build multimedia content and you in a YouTube channel or other stuff using this, that's a great that's a great idea and suggestion. So I really appreciate uh, your mentioning Simon. Yes, most definitely. And uh, at the end of the tour, I'll be giving out my email address. So if anyone wants to reach me or Stephen, 
Um, please contact us. Okay, we're going to move to... Oh, I'm sorry. If there's no other questions, we're going to move to the next area. Okay, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> well, are you from Pennsylvania yourself? And then originally, originally, I'm from Connecticut. And okay. uh, I moved to, to PA. So well, well, in... Mention a little bit to him how I think you were hoping to build some of these for the Archaeological Society, either the nationwide or the Pennsylvania one, as really. So I should say, Nova was a grad student in archaeology at Pennsylvania. And. Um, uh, I, well, IUP, and that was a part of the design of where she got started in Second Life and then also migrated into OpenSim. So, but we're still trying to find where we have that type of interaction with the service. So the archaeological societies was something we also wanted to bring people in here to help out with, but I'm not sure if that has, has all played up of what their interest was and, and all that. Nobody can speak to that. Right. Every time I talk about the virtual world, or the virtual platform at conferences, at archaeological pro, uh, conferences, they they kind of raise their eyebrow and go, well, you know, that's all fine and well, but that's not really where our head is at. So <laughs> I, I'm told that I always work outside of the box, but this is this is where things are going right now. Everything is getting more virtual and uh, going to text. So I think eventually you're going to see the significance of, of doing things virtually, and they may come around. But the uh, Society for uh, Society for Pennsylvania Archaeology knows about the virtual platform. SSA uh, knows about the virtual platform. Those are two nationwide groups. Uh, involved in archaeology, so they know of the existence and they uh, they've had some access to it, but they haven't physically come to the virtual world yet. Uh, hopefully, more of these streams are going to be reaching their attention, and they'll they'll finally go, aha! We better get over there. We shall see. I don't know. I, I'm gonna. Please tell me if this is, if you need to move on. I just because of several projects I'm in, like the one I just mentioned with the conference, the the outrageous idea has been occurring to me lately. Of uh, I'm supposed to give a talk on Zoom tomorrow to people in Europe about the metaverse and what is it and why should we care. And the other presenters, including Val, Val Librarian, uh, and Wisdom, and also Murat Gomez from Turkey, who's been in Second Life teaching for over 10 years, uh, are going to show lots and lots of pictures and, you know, make the case for how great it is to use virtual worlds. I'm going to make the case that we're already living in the virtual, in the metaverse, using Zoom and stuff. So my point is, is it, would it be fair to say that some of the material you're showing here your your professional colleagues would not have the remotest chance of experiencing it firsthand so that sharing it this way is a way to get them to see it and experience it and or being devil's advocate couldn't they just i'm going to mimic them why can't we just look at the pictures on the internet and get the same thing <laughs> so over <laughs> Wow, I like that interpretation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's basically it. Yeah, they, they don't see the relevance of showing it on a virtual platform. Uh, their, their favorite or my favorite line that they always use is, it's so cartoonish, how could you possibly take it seriously? So I, I just kind of nod my head and go on my merry way. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think that'll be the ongoing struggle that virtual presence worlds will continue to have. And, you know, one of these days somebody will have a breakthrough and I think can be able to convince a lot of people easily to at least encroach upon the space a little bit more. But I think for the sake of this tour and for the timing, I think we should go ahead and move on. And 
and, uh, you know, uh, hope that that conference goes well. Okay, we're going to move on to the next area if we're all done looking at the screens over here. Whoops, and I'm going to move into a planter. Oh my goodness. All right, this is the archaic period. And once again, the information is going to be placed into the local chat. Alrighty, hopefully everyone could see that. Okay, there's Beth. All right. Okay, are we able to read what I put in local chat? Okay, great. Begin or paste it? Sure. Thanks. Give you the whole paragraph. Here you go. Okay, we're waiting for Stephen. All right, and you can see on the slides uh, the transition that they went from the uh, Paleo Bear, Paleo Indian into the Archaic stage, and the different tools that were used. They were doing more grinding, as we could see from the grinding bowls, the grinding stones. And this is where they came up with the atlau, I believe. I have something over here stating that. Yes. And we did a reconstruction of what an atlau was like at the university, and we were trying to see how accurate it was by throwing it into the air. We, we, we weren't very good at our aim, but... That's what we practiced with. It was kind of fun. All right, do we have any questions for this area? No, I do not. Now, as I said earlier, I was taking a, a minor when I was doing my sociology. I took, I took the minor in anthropology, and this is where I got started doing uh, archaeology. Okay. I'm struck by this picture of the map with the blue, I mean the colored lines, and first I was thinking, oh, she's showing the trail of the Indians crossing over from Eurasia into South, and then no, these are, no. Um, there's a lot of continental, that's more continental divides than I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So I'm assuming they influenced how the tribes were able to move and when they moved and how they moved? Yes, yes. And that's another argument that goes around during the uh, during the conferences. Uh, the, I use the term migrating, and one of my advisors had, or one of the professors had said, "No, they don't migrate. Animals migrate. People don't <laughs> migrate." And I went, "Okay," but all the reports that I've read and written myself all use the term migrate so I'm going to stick with migrate we migrated well, from what north word to did south and east to, uh, tr I, you know what I really don't know but I was chastised for using the word migrate they transcended I, I believe was the terminology that I was supposed to use transcended like migrate is so much easier to write and to, to say. Yeah, they walked. Yeah, there you go. They walked. Sometimes they paddled. It all depended if they had a waterway. All right, we're going to jump up into the late woodland culture, which is what I'm more familiar with. And let me give you the text on that. I like the moving display. Thank you. Oh, good. Stephen's back. Yeah, I just need to switch over to Firestorm so I can take snapshots. <clears throat> okay. All right. I just gave you the text on the late woodland. And the panels describe what was discovered and where they were located. And see, this answers your previous question when we were over at the, uh, the Johnson site. You could see how vast uh, the late woodland culture took place. The representation in the middle on the circular rotating platform uh, shows what was in use during that time. Or what was in the area for, for food resources at that time. And we saw a progression of uh, using fish and bone as part of their tools and a lot of uh, pottery. And this also, for, for what we discovered, was the, uh, the time that they had actually farmed the land, more or less. They, they were growing crops. And this poster over here, to, they called that the Three Sisters. And corn, beans, and squash. And they used it in, in combination. So the corn was uh, providing shelter for the bean, for the squash. So all the plants kind of work together. Native populations uh, were so clever with agriculture. So, so another question, by the time this era of the culture, the corn had been I'm remembering that corn was a cultivated crop that was developed over centuries and until it became a, a reliable source of nutrition. So Yes, yes. All right, if we don't have any questions here, 
And if we're done reading the panels, we're going to jump back up to the contact period. And yes, Stephen, I was able to correct the, the posters. I'm so grateful to the person that pointed out how they should have been. So this is the contact period, and let me put up the uh, the paragraph so you could read it. All right, here we go. So during this period of when the Europeans came to the Americas, uh, the Native Americans were being introduced to their goods. And this panel here shows the transition of the trade goods from the contact period from the 1500s all the way up to the 1700s. We found a lot of copper uh, artifacts, and, and copper doesn't, doesn't work too well in the ground. It kind of disintegrates faster than, than stone tools, naturally. But we did find some copper in several of the sites. And then we have a... Uh, we have this panel here that shows all the tribes that were in North America and Mexico and in Canada. I, I don't know. I, I, I think maybe they were trying to see how well it, it could be worked with. So when they use it for trade, <coughs> maybe they were experimenting with it just to find out if it was good for cooking or, or good for tool making. I, I'm, I'm really not sure. But we did find several uh, objects of copper in some of the, uh, the units. Okay, this panel shows all the land that was seized from the Native Americans in 1783 with uh, broken promises of treaties, I, I will add. Yeah, it, it was pretty alarming. Of course, you, you don't read about this in, in your textbooks. You have to uh, take another course in Native American history to really find out how much damage we had done over the years to the people that had originally lived here. And yeah, what actually recently came up in the news recently from a Supreme Court case is very interesting, but I think people are getting more aware of it with time. Yes, and it's about time. It really is. And over here on this panel, I have the, uh, the archaeological sites that have been documented in the U.S. And there's so much more to be discovered, but you, it's a lot of paperwork to get there. In the center, 
I have Mount Rushmore. And for those that are not aware on the history of Mount Rushmore, it was originally a sacred land. And they were not consulted to do Mount Rushmore. Uh, they just built on this land without permission. And I have a picture of what it looked like originally. It was known to the Native Americans as three grandfathers. And I have a black and white picture of what it looked like before all the carvings took place. And that's why I have the uh, secondary image on the bottom of the rotating one with the uh, Native Americans of that time above the Mount Rushmore. And the, the book, I, I think you can, you can click on it to, to get a note card about the book. It's, it's a great book. It really is good. Okay, do we have any other questions over here or comments? And More of a comment. I, um, I'm kind of realizing your poster says archaeological, but I, uh, we went on, the Virtual Pioneers went on a tour a few months ago in another virtual environment where the trader had put a uh, Blackfoot nation as part of, he was doing Glacier National Park and apparently a whole corner of that is actually the Blackfoot Nation, which was kind of cool. He even showed the current boundary markers because he, he lives there. And uh, so it's kind of cool to see a recreation of a current Indian culture nation mm -hmm. as well as archaeological. Or I was working with uh, people that came from the uh, Pine Ridge Reservation. Uh, they were Lakota. So when I was making this area, I was trying to get as much information from them as I could because I wanted it to be pretty precise. I, I didn't want to give a, uh, I didn't want to give them my perspective. I wanted to show more of their perspective of, or more of a Native American's perspective. Um, so hopefully I, I did them justice. All right, we are, and, and thank you, Serena. Okay, we're going to go to the last area. And we're going to walk through this transparent panel and down the steps. This is the avatar agility test. Can you walk down the steps without crashing through? Yes, okay. All right, I did not do any text for this area. So I'll, I'll have to talk a little bit more. Uh, I call this the aspiring archeologist area, also known as Altaha, because that's what it was originally. 
uh, from a classmate. She had done a study of Mexico Altaha, and she was the first one that I had approached to use her PowerPoint slides, which I'm very happy to be able to have them here. I purposely left uh, panels empty in hopes that I could encourage other people to make a contribution here, which would serve as twofold. They would not only get exposure on a virtual platform, but they could also showcase their work to others. Uh, do you have to do you have to give them perms to do that permissions? Do I have to give them permission? No, uh, they could give me their their poster or their whatever it is that they want to make a contribution with, and then I will I will put it up here for them. So basically, I would need permission from them to use their work. Over here in the box, in the rotating box, I have the rules and regulations that we have to abide by as archaeologists. And uh, also what happens to looters, which I have that man in, in, the, uh, in the prison cell or cage, I guess, holding an artifact. It's a definite no-no. You don't walk along on, on sites and pick up things just because you think they're pretty and you have a right to them. So you could tap on that box to get the, uh, the rules and regulations that we have to abide by. And if you circle around this platform, I have a poster for stratification. Eventually, I, I will have a, a more informative display, but for now, we're just going to have to work with the posters. But this explains what stratif stratification is and um, at what levels you, you may find an artifact, or, or maybe not, I don't know. I've become very keen on learning how to read soil. It's not dirt, as I was told. It is soil. So I know how to read soil very, very well. And over here we have the uh, tools that we use. No There are no archaeological tools. We use tools for different from different trades, like the plumb bob is in carpentry. Rulers are from carpentry. Shovels, well, various trades use that, and as well as ropes and pails. Uh, we even use kitchen spoons, those large kitchen spoons when we're scooping out dirt, soil, <laughs> from a unit. I remember in college, I took a class about archaeology and when the professor told us we'd be brushing the soil away with a toothbrush. <laughs> yes. I, thought, I do not have the patience for this. <laughs> yes. And you have to go down 10 centimeters at a time, which could be extremely frustrating when, when you really want to get down to the bottom of the unit and you're told you could only go sen 10 centimeters at a time. I was like, oh my God. I remember the first unit, I had more red dog than anything. And it was so frustrating because I just wanted something. But no, red dog was my best friend at that unit. Okay, we're going to move over into the last area here. And I'm going to... And it is very red. So we called it Red Dog. Okay, these are the toys that I got to play with at IUP.
and you have the stream X, which is this very large GPR machine. It took three people to run this. Well, along with the driver. So you had the driver and you had two people in the back uh, monitoring the 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 Oh God! The, I, I want to say the laptop, but yeah, it it was a laptop, and then the third person was walking in the back to make sure that this was stationary and going along the right track. Uh, the graph shows an illustration of what one of the surveys showed, and I think we discovered a pipeline that was running through the this uh, field over here. So the PowerPoint screen explains what the machine does and uh, just a few basic information with it. And the next is, uh, I call it my glorified lawnmower. But it was a rather cool machine. I had used, thank you so much, Serena. I had used this machine on my farm and it picked up two large abnormalities. I made a, we had a 20 by 40 grid and then a 40 by 60 grid next to the barn. Uh, some background information about my home. It was built in 18... 56, I believe. So it had a long history in the neighborhood. And when I, when I did the results of the, uh, the data and saw these two abnormalities, I did some more background information. And in the area, in my immediate area, there are are tannery wells or there were tannery wells so these could be tannery wells or they could be cisterns we're not sure I I haven't dug up the land yet my neighbors are against it but you know how inquisitive archaeologists are eventually uh, we're going to dig it up how did you create these models with great difficulty, <laughs> really. With let great me be more difficulty. specific. Uh, blender, mesh tools, um, assembling no. tools from a store, or what? No, no. I uh, the the first model. Out of frustration, I finally asked somebody to make it for me. So the first model is basically all mesh. The second model, the one that we're standing in front of, that is uh, parts and pieces of other items that I put together. So it's uh, prims. And the third model, the 3D C10 scanner, this is all mesh. So I'm. Are you? Are you a mesh builder now? No, I am not. No, I am not. I am learning mesh, but I could not say with a good conscience that I am a mesh builder. I am learning it. Oh. But this is uh the last model is like I said. The Lacto scan station. See, Ted, this is what I did my thesis on. And I was able to incorporate all the models that I made into the open source, uh, open sim, and on this grid. Yeah, that's me looking like a construction worker. Yep, yep. I was with the uh, National Park Service. This is their area, and I was working with them. And where you're seeing me stand, it was like 
three inches of mud. So they had to get some cardboard pieces so I could put the stand up without it sinking into the mud. And I was having a panic attack because I was responsible for this very expensive machine. And then uh, my, my friend who was uh, the curator over at the Allegheny Portage Historic site, she says, Mayor, look like a professional so I take your picture. <laughs> And that's the professional picture she took. <laughs> it's like, oh my God. This is so, so amazing, Nova. I love that you've put this together. I have all three of these models uh, at the Allegheny area and then the Portridge area. So I was able to incorporate my thesis into the virtual world. And that's that's where I had defended it as well. Uh, I had done a, a presentation on the, uh, at some conference on the virtual platform. And I had told my advisor, okay, I already defended my thesis. Do I have to do it again? And they went, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, darn. I'm, I'm struck by the the arch, but I can't imagine the arch was built, or was it, by the Indian culture? The arch? This, this large hedge? Well, the arch tunnel over here with your, you in the picture, and it looks like you scanned it. Oh, no, that wasn't done by the Indian culture. No, 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 no. Okay, I'm, I'm missing the connection. Sorry. <laughs> no, this was, uh, this is the Skew Arc Bridge located in Portage, PA. I did my thesis with the National Park Service, and this is part of their... Um, this is part of their, um, good Lord, I'm having a brain fart. Part of their historic area that they have. So it was the Skew Arc Bridge, the Lemon House, and the, uh, the Engine House, number nine, that was all in, within that area at the National Park Service. Well, but thank you yes, so much for is, having us. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, just to answer Sidearm's question too, is that it also has a recreation of the Portage site. That's a different this one and so again her archaeology covers a mix of different time periods including some really cool uh the lemon house and even more recent you know human uh, excavations very cool nova have you had any um schools visit and use this no uh -huh. not that i'm aware of and once again i keep trying to encourage teachers to to come up here i don't know how to get their attention i really don't uh it was suggested that i i make a a powerpoint slide and put it on the thumb drive and give it to them directly i i don't know <laughs> it's too late for coffee anyway Stephen. but thank you <laughs> No, it's never too late for coffee. <laughs> so I am open for suggestions. I I, uh, I have run out of ideas, and every year I get so frustrated because I know what my goals are, and I, I can see the importance of how this could be used in classrooms, and I go, oh, my God, are you really going to bang your head against that wall and try again? 
And every year I'm back here banging the drum saying, <laughs> come on, people, let's get on the stick. It's here. It could be used. It's helpful. Don't ignore it. So if you want to help me bang on that drum, more power to you. I am here for anyone to, to consult with, to collaborate with. I just refuse to give up. Good for you. Well, I need to log off, Nofa, but thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Stephen, for all your help. Spiff for live streaming. Sidearm for your participation. Glad you found us, Kurt. Jackson for helping us with all the um, advertising. And Nova, if you see Max, please tell her we're sorry we didn't make it to visit her grid. Okay, great. Yes, I will. I will. Okay. And thank you all for attending.